Hello, and welcome to Bios Frontier Science. Today, we're absolutely thrilled to welcome Sarkis Mismani, Louis and Nelly Sooks, Professor of Microbiology at Caltech, to the show. Sarkis, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having thank me, Chris. Thank you, too. thank you, Drew. To kick things off, Sarkis, can you share a brief introduction with us? Sure. I'm a microbiologist by training, a PhD uh, from UCLA in uh, microbiology and immunology. I uh, did my postdoctoral work at Harvard Medical School, where I expanded the work to look at immunologic influences of bacteria, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get into more detail about that, and then uh, started my first academic appointment, my only academic appointment at Caltech in late 2006, and I've been here ever since. And we're excited to dive in and learn more. But before doing so, one question we love to ask our guests. Throughout your career, what has been your North Star? the common thread, if you will, that ties all of your work together? Uh, I think the, the guiding principle has just been to really leverage basic fundamental discovery to try and improve human health. And this is, again, done through hypothesis-driven work in uh, model systems and laboratories that inform us about biology that we can leverage to potentially either develop new therapeutics or think about ways of preventing disease in, in humans. Phenomenal mission. And to dive into that a little bit further and learn more, I'm going to pass it off to Drew to talk about how the microbiome can regulate biology. Thank you very much, Sarkis, once again for joining us. We're so excited to have you and dive into our first topic here. Sarkis, at a, a high level, as you mentioned, your lab focuses on understanding and approaching the immunologic and neurologic imbalances that underlie many diseases through the influence of complex interactions between the microbiome and animals. Uh, you, you were in your lab approach this by aiming to discover how gut bacteria influence the development and function of the immune nervous system with the goal of understanding mechanisms uh, by which microbiome continues uh, the critical imbalance between health and science and disease. To provide a bit of context for our audience, Sargas, can you just share a bit more about the history of the microbiome field to begin with? You know, like most things that we're studying in, in modern biomedicine, the roots of, of our particular discipline, and again, many other disciplines really lie in discoveries that were made in many cases hundreds of years ago. Um, and, you know, I think a large part of what happens in, in current research is applying new tools to test concepts that have been in human consciousness for, for again, generations. Uh, and so in many ways, I think, you know, the microbiome was appreciated you know, in terms of its potential to impact biology well over 100 years ago. There's writings from, in English, even beyond that, right? But writings from people like Ali Metchnikoff and Louis Pasteur um, really were in, critical in, in making us understand that they were thinking about, you know, bacteria that live in a non-infectious way with people and what are the potential you know, implications of that to, to our biology, let alone to our health. But I would say that really the modern rendition of microbiome research, you know, really took off in, you know, the, the early 2000s. And again, it took off means like, you know, those first few papers, you know, that, uh, again, gave us some biological and mechanistic insight into how the microbiome may be functioning how the microbiome even assembles itself. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about what the microbiome is. Um, uh, the, the, those trickle of papers really came out in, 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 you know, I said about 20 years ago or so, a little over 20 years ago. And, but I think what really supercharged the field and really catalyzed um, its growth and its almost exponential growth in the past 15 years or so is the application of DNA sequencing technology um, to this particular problem. And a lot of this really dovetailed off of the human genome project, where both the sequencing capability and more importantly, I think the data storage and bioinformatic capabilities allowed a large scale analysis of uh, essentially of DNA as a representation of, of, uh, of biology um, uh, to occur, right? And that's again led to you know, many discoveries, both in the, in genomics, but also in the genetic application of, of that research. And once that infrastructure and capability was built, you know, I think it was you know, easy to, to have that be portable 
to other problems in biology and the microbiome really lends itself to the applications um, that that's uh, come from DNA sequencing because at the end of the day, you know, we can uh, we can certainly collect the samples right where microbes live, and that's nine nine out of a hundred times fecal material, uh, so it's accessible. But also the fact that we can get a glimpse into who's there through DNA sequencing, but also start you know hypothesizing about what those organisms may be doing. Because by sequencing DNA, you can get a, uh, a, a, an idea into, you know, what is the, the product of uh, a transcription translational event of that, of that DNA, and then hypothesize, you know, biochemical reactions and, and, and subsequent biology that happens um, within a host or within a, an aquatic or terrestrial ecosystem. And again, those, that research beyond human health has been really exciting as well. And I feel like, and this is my personal opinion, I feel like in many ways um, that initial uh, uh, you know explosion of research uh, uh, really attracted computer scientists and um, uh, and you know people thinking about the microbiome from a non-biological perspective. And I think this bears out in the data. But again, it's also coupled to what's technically feasible or what was technically feasible, and the fact that really some of the major discoveries uh, in the Let's say from 2000, I'm ballparking 2005 to let's say 2015, were really based on association studies in humans where you know microbiomes were sequenced in a particular context. Let's say disease versus healthy people, or people on certain diets, people living in certain geographies, and really a lot of comparative and associative uh, analyses of what a microbiome structure looks like in multiple different contexts. And I really feel like it's been the last five, seven or so years where, um, again, these are really rough generalizations, but really people have sort of rolled up their sleeves and started asking questions about mechanisms of action and how the microbiome may be influencing biology in, you know, within the microbiome itself, but, you know, also within the hosts that harbor those, those microbiomes. So think about how microbiomes may improve or augment immune system function or May may uh, impact our metabolism, or even our behavior or mood, right? You know, all of these questions. I think you know really started to you know in a more mainstream way started to become um, uh, uh, tractable to people in the last you know let's say, let's say less than a decade or so. And I think this really presents an exciting opportunity because I feel like now we're more at the stage by understanding biology of thinking about how we can you know implement these learnings. Um, for outcomes, right? As opposed to just saying, you know, certain profiles correlate with health, certain profiles correlate with disease or correlate with a specific diet. But we can start to ask questions of, so what goes wrong in a biological system? Maybe that equates to disease, maybe not, but, you know, it's, you know, a general question. And then think about ways that the microbiome may allow us to fix that. And again, I, I mean, this is, you know, really brought over you. I think I probably covered a lot, but I'll just make one more point and just bring it back to, to genetics. Right is, you know, it's my personal belief that many, you know, you know, both illnesses as well as just conditions are the product of gene environment interactions, um, and most in most cases, truth be told, we don't know what, what those genes and environmental interactions are, but in those cases where we do, um, it's just much harder to repair genetic lesions or genetic predispositions um, than it is to repair the contributions of environmental you know, uh, influences to disease like the microbiome, right? I mean, you know, we live in a world where we can change people's microbiomes. You know, again, we still lack, you know, those sort of personalized or the rationale to know what microbiomes to change into, but technically it's feasible. Whereas, uh, you know, removing a genetic predisposition or risk factor, uh, what have you, that still remains very, very challenging. So again, uh, part of the reason why I'm just optimistic about the future of this work is that I believe that as we learn more, we're going to be able to do more uh, via the microbiome than, let's say, you know, for example, genetic uh, predisposition. I think it's a perfect overview, Sarkis. I really appreciate it. And it's fascinating coming from your own words. Um, and I, I love that you started to mention your own motivations and your focus towards it. Uh, really, as a, as a pioneer of, of this field, Sarkis, um, both in developing this field further and in creating the microbiome department at Caltech, um, Maybe could you just share a bit more about what drove you to the microbiology space in the first place? 
uh, microbiology in general was um, uh, my my you know sort of attraction to microbiology really happened at a at a very early career stage, um, relatively early. I guess it happened uh, part of my way through college, and you know, I think it's a trivial reason um, was that. Um, microbiology was very research oriented, at least the way it was taught at UCLA where I was an undergrad. And, um, and so that's why it was like, I chose microbiology over, let's say like cancer biology or something. Right. So uh, again, not a strong, um, reason for that particular discipline. But again, once I, I started to learn more and more about microbiologists from this, you know, research centric, uh, teaching perspective, then it became, you know, something that I got very passionate about. And early on, as I mentioned, my, my work was in infectious disease, or at least laboratory models of infectious disease. And, um, but maybe to, more to your question of, um, you know, when did I start getting tracked about the microbiome? It's really the transition between my thesis work, the end of my uh, graduate uh, career, and really think about what I wanted to do in the next phase of my scientific career. And, you know, by this point, I had already become um, a real fan of microbiology research itself and, and really, actually more, more accurately, a real fan of microbes themselves, right, of just being these really versatile little machines that would adapt to their environment and be able to perform almost incredible, like unbelievable functions um, was really just super interesting to me. Um, but I want to do something a little bit different, a little bit different than what mainstream research was at the time, um, which, again, in my opinion, really revolved around either infectious disease or microbial metabolism. Either, you know, think about how bacteria cause disease or think about how bacteria just live and, and perform the biological function is sort of these two camps within microbiology. Again, I'm generalizing. But I want to, again, do something a little bit more off the beaten path. Um, and I first didn't know what it was, but I just started reading broadly about microbiology research. And I came across uh, like a one or two page opinion article from Jeff Gordon, who's really a pioneer in microbiome research um, and was you know, actually referred to his work when I said those first few papers in the early 2000s were coming out. I was speaking specifically about Jeff. And it was really this, the, the take home message was that we have hundreds of different species of bacteria, trillions of cells in our body we're living with these organisms shortly after birth and until the day we die. Um, and as a, as humans, we really don't know what they're doing, right? What, how they get there, what they really are, and how do they sort of network with us as, as, you know, a, an organism ourselves. Right. Um, and I have to say, it was just, you know, it just really caught my attention, right. You know, lar largely because there was just so much that was not known. I think it's obvious to everyone that, you know, when you harbor more bacterial cells than human cells in your body, those bacterial cells are probably doing something important. And so I figured we'd go and try and understand what that was. Yeah, of, of course. And it's a, it's great to see from your perspective, the history of how the field's even evolved itself um, from approach, from focus, uh, and really taking this forward. Uh, bringing this now to current history uh, and, and what you're doing with your own lab specifically. Um, with the understanding that you've given, the history, the background, can you give us an overview of your own work within the microbiome space currently? Um, yeah, so uh, when I started, maybe I'll just go back a little bit in time uh, to give you perspective and, um, and then talk about our current work. Um, when I started here at Caltech, I was uh, very much focused on uh, how the immune system uh, uh, responds to the microbiome. What I mean by that is, so if we think about all the things that we learned as children or throughout our lives uh, about microbes, um, you know, in most cases, I think, you know, people would say is that, you know, my first thought or exposure to microbes were thinking about how they make us sick, right? How they maybe these insidious little creatures and they're only out to, to essentially get us um, because that's how they replicate and that's how they make more bacteria. Um, but really what our work and, and uh, you know, other people as well, other labs as well, but what our work really showed was that the immune system wasn't, didn't just evolve to control microbes as the infectious disease hypothesis would suggest, but really has had evolved to respond to microbes and to learn from microbes in terms of how immune 
profiles and immune responses can be improved. Um, and it was really sort of this concept supported by early data from, from our lab that, that I think, you know, was both exciting to me and I think helped propel the field is this, this, this discovery, this understanding that immune systems in mice work better when those mice are colonized with bacteria. It's just that the bacteria that make us healthy are different than the bacteria that make us sick, right? So we're focused on a handful of, for all the right reasons, focus on a handful of organisms that cause disease, but we're really ignoring all these other organisms, which, you know, improved immune function. That's what we work on, but also helped us with our digestion, you know, provide us with nutrients, vitamins, cofactors for, for our health, right? And, and just really thinking about just how these beneficial organisms impacted our own physiology in beneficial ways. And again, particularly in terms of the immune system. And we showed that bacteria colonizing mice help those animals fight off autoimmune diseases, help them fight off infections from other, from other pathogenic bacteria. And really, I think, you know, introduce this new paradigm, this new concept that immune systems actually function better in the presence of microbes. Again, beneficial microbes that really, you know, augment, you know, the, the immune system's ability to, to perform its functions. And again, I think this, this conceptual leap, you know, really opened up people's eyes and including our own about where, you know, sort of the, the benefits or the, the, you know, the reach of the microbiome may be. And then I started thinking, you know, beyond just the immune system, which I think is, you know, more proximal, so more, maybe a little bit more obvious that the immune system would respond to microbes. But, you know, I think the early successes we had in our lab, again, after 2006, so let's say around 2010 or so, we started thinking, you know, is the potential benefit of the microbe, of the microbiome going beyond just the immune system? Can we think about even something as protected as the nervous system being influenced by the microbiome? And i um, happy to go into details, but there was a set of actual events, conversations with people and research findings that um, really got us excited about, you know, thinking how microbes may improve the function of the nervous system, whether that be in, in behavior uh, or even think about neurodegenerative diseases. And um, over the years, our work has evolved to now exclusively focus on what one may call just the gut-brain connection and the gut-brain connection specifically viewed through the lens of the microbiome. And so we now work on mouse models of neurodegeneration, mouse models of neurodevelopment, as well as mouse models of other emotional behaviors, and try and understand how microbes send their signals to the brain, how those signals influence outcomes such as health or disease, or such as behaving one way or the other. And as I said earlier, really take these observations down to the mechanistic level, try and understand you know, to whatever degree of detail we possibly can, which, what are the organisms producing which molecules, which bind to particular receptors on cells that mediate an effect in, in the host, right? And really sort of, you know, trace that circuit from microbe to the brain in ways that both leads to, uh, you know, a basic understanding of biology, but also give us, you know, potential places to intervene in those cases where biology may become uh, dysregulated, which may be again the, the basis of disease, and so more maybe more particularly, we've worked on mouse models of autism over the years, uh, mouse models of anxiety, uh, and uh, looking at and also look at social behaviors in mice. Again, specifically trying to understand how microbes send their signals to the brain, whether they're small molecules, whether they're using neuronal connections like the vagus nerve, or even the immune system to communicate between the gut and the brain. And then, um, and then a large part of our current research program is focused on Parkinson's disease, which has some really interesting ties to the gut, which has been the, which have been known actually for many many hundreds of years. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of evidence, at least in mouse models, that the microbiome is a, a critical contributor to the symptoms and the pathology associated with Parkinson's. So we're really bullish about that work. Um, and so, uh, and again, you know, all. All of this, um, uh, you know, just to reinforce this, all of, all of our research projects are really grounded in just trying to, you know, make basic discoveries of biology, trying to understand how cells, tissues, and organisms work. Because I think that that foundation 
doesn't just lead you to you know therapies it leads you to an understanding that would in in, in the ideal scenario be an engine for many many different types of, of therapies and so again i think there's just more more you know impact by understanding the biology as opposed to just screening molecules to try and see which one is going to make a condition go away right and i, I love the approach of fundamental science here and I really appreciate you going into the overall history of the lab and that evolution over time. I'm super excited to dive into your current research as well with the gut-brain connection later in the episode. Um, but as we're on this historical aspect here, um, something I, I really wanted to focus was just curious about as well from your own perspective as someone in history in the microbiome space. Um, I mean, while investigating this space early on, your seminal work led to the discovery of the first microbial molecule that has direct beneficial effects on mammals. Um, could you describe the impact of discovering the first therapeutic uh, benefit um, within the, the space itself and really just overall how that provided uh, impact to the field overall? When we started the work in terms of looking at how the immune system responded to the microbiome, again, in ways that are beneficial, in ways that augment immune function, and again, not talking about infectious disease where the immune system is trying to control or, or, or kill uh, a bacteria or a microbe. Um, initially, we didn't know what to, what to sort of look for, right? And so our, some of the initial hypotheses in setting up these models were really, you know, really grounded in, in just the, the fundamentals of how does a microbiome even form, right? I mean, how does an animal acquire organisms? What are the sort of the competition between bacteria? in allowing you know, certain organisms to colonize and not others? And how do organisms set up long-term residence in a host with an immune system, right? If you think about this, it's, you know, it's a, there's a really sort of counterintuitive point here is that we as, as humans and many, uh, many, many, many other animals with both innate and adaptive immune systems, you know, colonize the bacteria for life. Like, why don't we just remove these bacteria? Why doesn't the immune system not attack these bacteria and and get rid of them. Like how did these how did this sort of cooperation or truce evolve over the years? And really just trying to set up you know initial models to look at some of the basic fundamentals you know in terms of you know, you know what microbes can colonize and what are the dynamics of colonization. And along the way, we were you know profiling immune responses and just trying to get a glimpse into how those colonization events affected the the overall makeup of the mouse immune system. And we made a discovery uh, early on in the project that changed what questions we were asking. And that discovery was that when we looked in the spleens of mice that either had an intact microbiome versus mice that had no microbiomes, there was a, a huge change in the proportion of T cells in the spleen of the mice. So the mouse that had, was colonized had many, many more T cells in its spleen than mice that were missing bacteria. And again, and this is in the spleen, right? We're not even talking about the, the mucosal tissue in the in the intestine. So this is a, a systemic effect of the microbiome. And, and I thought to myself, I, I couldn't figure out a reason why why this would occur, right? Well, like a, such a fundamental arm of our immune system, our T cells, their development was somehow tied to the colonization of that animal by by you know symbiotic or, or commensal bacteria. And then so we started asking questions of can we identify individual bacteria that um, can recapitulate the effects of an intact microbiota? So do we need hundreds of species of bacteria to elevate those T-cell proportions, or are there individual bacteria which they, they themselves can, can perform this function? And we identified an organism, a human organism called Bacteria fragilis, which itself was able to essentially restore T-cell profiles similar to that of a mouse that had many, many different species of bacteria. So we set up animals that were monocolonized. They only had one species of bacteria in them, and their T-cell profiles in Spain looked similar to mice that had many dozens of, of uh, maybe even hundreds of bacteria in their intestines. And so now armed with that information, we, we then we asked the next question, which is getting to, to your point, true of is there a defined molecule in bacteria spagillus, which in and of itself is sufficient or maybe even required for the ability of the bacteria to elevate T cell proportions. And we identified a molecule called uh, polysaccharide A or PSA. And when I say identified, it was, the molecule was already known. We identified a new function for that molecule. 
So the molecule is a, a large carbohydrate found on the surface of uh, bacteria's fragilis, again, it's called polysaccharide or PSA. And it's got some really interesting properties in terms of how it interacts with the immune system. So namely, um, and this may get a little bit into the weeds um, and is a little bit immunologically heavy, but um, we have these molecules on our um, uh, angiopresenting cells, uh, like macrophages and dendritic cells, called uh, MHC class two molecules. So these are molecules that present peptides from pathogens to T cells and then elicit a T cell response. And I got, again, I know for many in the audience, this may be uh, details. But the reason why this was uh, uh, important to our research is that all the prior research uh, on this MHC reaction, ma major histocompatibility complex reaction with T cells, had shown that the information that was relayed between this, this MHC molecule and the T cell receptor was based on a peptide sequence. So MHC molecules present peptides to T cells. Mm -hmm. That's how T cells know what they're recognizing. And the peptide could be, let's say, from an you know, COVID or, or Staph aureus or some other pathogen, right? Um, and so what was really unique about this um, bacterial polysaccharide was that this is a pure polysaccharide, it has no protein component, but it was presented on MHC class two to T cells. So this is like almost immunologic heresy, what I'm just, what I'm telling you, but we now know, <clears throat> we now have lots of evidence that this actually happens. And so that gave us a clue, right? They gave us a clue that, in fact, this molecule may be, you know, involved in T cell biology because it's actually presented by our own immune system to T cells, by other cells of our body, like macrophages and dendritic cells, to T cells. And so we dug a little bit deeper into this particular interaction, right? This interaction between how our immune cells are using this molecule from bacteria fragilis, which is very atypical for that interaction, and showed that the type of T cell that was elicited by polysaccharide A or PSA was a unique class of T cell called regulatory T cell. And so again, I'm gonna take one step back, uh, just give a little bit of, of an overview of immunology is, um, so you know, I, I sometimes liken the immune system to a loaded gun, right? So we have these cells and molecules ready to attack as soon as we become infected. Right, just sort of the charge of the immune system is how it works. But in the meantime, while the immune system is sort of, let's say, in a simplified example, waiting uh, for something to attack, it shouldn't, the immune system should not become active, right? It should be ready to respond, but it should not be responding in the absence of an infection. So part of, and maybe a major role of regulatory T cells is to keep the immune system in a sort of a balanced state, right? And to prevent inflammation until you know, the opportunity is required for the immune system to become activated. And so, again, that's the overview. So what, what polysaccharide A, a PSA, did is it induced the development of regulatory T cells or anti-inflammatory T cells. So now if you think about this compared to an infectious disease or an infectious agent, this is the opposite response of what an infectious agent would do to the immune system. Infectious agents activate the immune system. Again, that's how things work. Right? But here's a bacterial molecule which was on its surface suppressing inflammation, keeping immune function low. Right? And so there's two outcomes over our research that, that you know, and then subsequent research to what I've described that have led us to understand why um, uh, PSA may have evolved and how we can harness that to potentially help people. And this is to your question. The first is going back to the original premise that I described of why does our immune system not attack bacteria in our own intestines? Well, we think one of those reasons, there's probably many reasons, probably many mechanisms, but one of those reasons is that the bacteria that live inside of us and want to live with us for many, many years, A, don't, not only do they not activate the immune system, but they actively locally suppress the immune system, right? So they prevent the immune system from attacking them, right? And they do so in a way that doesn't cripple the immune system, but just allows that organism to live and not be uh, eradicated by the immune system, uh, by the immune response in the intestines. So there's a clearly a selfish aspect in, from the microbes perspective for why they would evolve this, this function, right? Is again, so that they can live in a host 
that has an immune system so they can live there for many, many years and not be attacked, right? But, you know, and so again, I think, I believe that's the evolutionary driver for why organisms have developed, for why PSA developed and why organisms have developed molecules like PSA. But I feel like, you know, we can, you know, we realize that we can harness this activity to actually help people. And the reason for that is it, at the time we were doing this research, again, about 15 years ago or so, it was already well known and we know even, you know, we're even more confident now that the result of many autoimmune and allergic disorders in humans is the result of an overactive immune system. So those of us who have autoimmune or allergic conditions, a large part of that is our own immune system attacking us, right? Immune system becoming activated in the absence of an overt infection or actually being chronically uh, overactive. And so we thought to ourselves, well, you know, if we have a microbial molecule which naturally suppresses or balances the immune system, can we now actually use this molecule? And again, maybe evolve just to, you know, for the, for the microbe to, to coexist with humans. I wonder if we wondered if we can use this molecule to then uh, develop new therapies for autoimmune or allergic disorders. And that's what we did. And so we first started with Crohn's disease because, or at least mouse models of Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease is an, is an intestinal inflammatory disorder that um, uh, results in, in chronic immune activation, gastrointestinal symptoms, sometimes very severe, be crippling to certain people, huge bouts of weight loss, uh, and really affects quality of life in, in a lot of people. And so we asked, if we set up mouse models of Crohn's disease, mouse models of intestinal inflammation, and just treat with this anti-inflammatory organism, we make the condition better, the immunologic condition better. And in fact, we showed that we could by giving, again, the bacteria just a purified molecule, PSA alone, just given orally to mice, you know, both prevented development of Crohn's disease, but also was therapeutic. It made the actual Crohn's disease that was established uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, became alleviated and the symptoms went away and the intestinal inflammation went away. And so again, we figure out the mechanisms. Again, it's inducing regulatory T cells in the context of inflammation um, and, uh, and lots of, you know, mechanistic bells and whistles. But really the, the goal of that basic research was to show that indeed we're, we can improve this, this condition. And then we also applied it um, to mouse models of uh, neuroinflammation, so this is not neuroscience, but just thinking about like multiple sclerosis models. And in fact, its effects were not just local to the gut, but it was able to suppress inflammation even in the brain. Other people have now looked in diabetes models and uh, allergy models like asthma models and shown some of the same things. And so um, again, really, uh, hopefully this, this short story sort of highlights what I mentioned is like really trying to understand basic mechanisms, you know, basic biology, trying to understand like the evolutionary uh, impetus for why those systems develop, but always keep an eye on how do you harness those learnings to help with a, you know, with, you know, at least in a mouse model disease, but hopefully with people. And so um, we're hopeful that uh, PSA will be developed uh, for clinical application to the best of our knowledge, both in mouse models and, and where we've done mechanistic work and, and there are you know, interventional work, but also in observational research from humans, there's no reason, that at least is apparent to me, why this molecule should be harmful in any way. Um, it, you know, it, there shouldn't really be huge side effects, and there shouldn't really be the side effects that the current medications for Crohn's disease or, or MS or asthma have, which is like systemic immunosuppression. I think maybe this is a, a, a nice point to end this comment on, is... Um, the, the main line there, the majority of therapies, the main line therapies for autoimmune allergic disorders are, uh, are medications that essentially weaken the immune system. So if you have an immune system that's attacking you, what modern medicine does is just knocks out aspects of the immune system so it'll stop attacking you, right? And so what PSA does is it doesn't actually inhibit the immune system. It doesn't actually weaken the immune system. It just balances the immune system, balances the pro and anti-inflammatory uh, reactions of the immune system. And so not only do we feel that it would be a better therapeutic because you're not going to have this immunosuppression, which comes along with most medications for autoimmune or inflammatory disorders, we've actually shown 
that PSA makes animals better able to fight off infection. And so again, it's not immunosuppressing animals, it's actually improving the ability of those animals to mount a, a productive pro-inflammatory immune response. And I think this is what you get when you have a balanced immune system. So we're hopeful that it'll both be safe and more effective than current therapies and not have the side effects of current therapy. Wow. I mean, that's fascinating and looking forward to see how that progresses in the clinic and then just forward in the future. Um, I it just, I, I'm, I'm so curious with your perspective, uh, Sarkis, as, as someone who really believes in fundamental science to approach life sciences, greatest challenges here um, through your own lab and your own research, um, as we gain a better understanding of how to tackle these complex systems, uh, how will we continue to improve drug development and kind of the current therapeutic pipeline we see today and then the current biotech stack? So is your question, how do we improve, how do we use the microbiome to improve current therapeutics or, or just? Yeah. To, to clarify, any, any mechanism. Think, yeah, from, from your own perspective, Sarkis, as someone who has been around the space of let's understand the basic science and see how it applies to therapeutics. Um, I, I'd be really curious from your own perspective, um, how your own work in the microbiome space or just how as we gain a better understanding um, for our microbiome, its interaction in the uh, gut brain barrier, you know, or the connection there, um, everything in between, um, as we gain a better understanding of that and how the microbiome interacts with us, uh, how could that potentially cause a, a better understanding for drug development or future therapies uh, yeah. going forward? Sure. Um, so, you know, I think what a lot of people are, including us, are focused on are, you know, trivially speaking, drugs from bugs, right? Is to try and understand, are there particular organisms, or I gave an example, you say molecules from organisms, which they themselves can be the therapeutic, right? So think about fecal transplants, which actually, I think it was October of last year, 2022, the first uh, FDA approved microbiome-based drug came into existence, and that's a fecal transplant for Clostridium difficile infection. This is done by Rebiotics and Faring Pharmaceuticals, and I feel and I, I believe there's multiple approvals that will also happen this year. And so again, really a watershed moment for for the microbiome. But again, it also tells you if fecal transplants are the first therapeutic or, or approved therapeutic for microbiome, it almost tells you that we still really don't understand what the microbiome is doing, right? Because we're just giving everything from one healthy donor to an individual who would need some medical attention, again, in this case, with a recurrent uh, pseudomembranous colitis or classroom difficile infection, it's not like we know what, what particular organism molecule to give, right? Again, so we're still very unsophisticated as a community in terms of what will work in people. But again, lots of academic and, and uh, industry efforts to identify uh, more applications for fecal transplants, but also other modalities, such as uh, single organisms, such as which are known as LBPs or live biologic uh, products or biotherapeutic products. Um, you know, one can think about small molecules or even large molecules in the microbiome. And I think there's some advantages there as well in terms of um, uh, both manufacturing and, and, and getting so regulatory protection. It's harder to do that with a live organism than it is with a defined chemical entity. And so, you know, in those cases where the research is advanced, where you know what the, what the molecule is, I think those make good drugs, right? But also maybe a, to a lesser extent, something that's not being done broadly is thinking about ways of drugging the microbiome, of taking either known or novel small molecules with the target being a microbial enzyme or, or target, not a host target, right, which is all the drugs that we take, right? And so, um, so there's a number of different modalities. But then, you know, I think maybe what would be really, to answer your point, what would be really helpful, uh, especially from understanding basic biology, is when you, when you understand a, a mechanism of action, when you understand a disease process, it gives you multiple, potentially multiple uh, ways of intervening and multiple places to intervene in that, um, you know, in that, you know, biology, right? So again, uh, I'll make up a trivial, I'm not make up, but I'll, I'll give you an example of what's likely happening. We don't have too many, you know, concrete, you know, 
um, uh, details of this, but for example, let's say there's bacteria X making a molecule that is then, you know, targeting a liver cell that then leads to hepatic cell carcinoma, right? Um, you could either get rid of the bacteria, you could soak up the molecule, you could inhibit the receptor that it's binding to, you could somehow uh, improve the outcome of the cell that that, that molecule is, is affecting. See, so what I'm saying is that once you know the biology, it gives you many, many different places to intervene. And I feel like this is, you know, in many ways, hopefully where the microbiome uh, drug development efforts will go is really, you know, leveraging deep understanding of biology to think about new ways of intervening in a disease process. And again, really thinking about ways, which I don't think we do well in this country, but really think about ways of, of bolstering health, like throughout life, not waiting for disease to occur before we actually do something uh, about it. And again, I feel like the microbiome offers those those avenues because there are just tangible ways that I, that we can improve microbiome health. Um, and maybe we want to talk about those as well. But again, I feel like, you know, the long-term implications of, um, of the microbiome in terms of drug development may be, you know, based in, again, in, in, you know, in mechanistic insights. I'll make one more comment is, um, and this isn't to, you know, to, discourage more work in the microbiome far from it. I think it's, I think there's a lot that we need to understand is, I mean, drug, you know, traditional drug development is, you know, a much more mature field than microbiome-based therapeutics, obviously. Um, and what modern drugs do is they have huge effect, or many, some of them have huge effect sizes, right? I mean, they've been sort of engineered, especially if you think about biologics, you know, which have really come online in the last 10, 20 years, right? have these huge effects on people. I mean, there's huge side effects that come along, but, you know, they, they, are, they work, right? But they work by really, you know, changing biological, like dramatically changing biological pathways. You know, currently at least, you know, I don't see a lot of evidence that the microbiome has the effect size of, let's say, an anti-TNF that's used in Crohn's disease or, or other autoimmune diseases, right? And so I think one area for improvement isn't, you know, again, trying to understand base biology, isn't to understand what the microbiome does during life, but how do we increase or how do we tweak what the microbiome is doing? Maybe, you know, think about ways of engineering the effects of, of the microbiome to, you know, increase their beneficial effects, right? And again, there's probably a number of ways that, that, that this can happen. And I think this is how we should be thinking, right? I feel like there should be like almost a phase shift in the way we're doing research and not just understand what evolution has created in terms of avenues to improve health, but how do we harness that to make it even better, right? And this happens in drug discovery, and, oh, sorry, drug development all the time, right? Is they take one scaffold of a drug that worked well, but then they modify it, now it works much, much better than the, the parent drug, right? Uh, and so I feel like we can be, we should be doing more of this with the microbiome. Fascinating, thank you so much, Sarkis, for that. That overview an explanation of, of really how the field's going to progress overall. Um, I, I want to transition to our, our next topic here, um, just to dive into your work specifically uh, through this space. And you know, we 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 were you know lucky enough to hear you dive into your work earlier with IBD. Um, I, I think I really wanted to focus among your other efforts within your lab surrounding autism, Parkinson's disease, um, and some of your other major focuses currently. Taking things a step forward, uh, continuing with your other focuses within your lab, um, considering the applications within um, autism and other behavioral works that you focused on within mouse models and, and, and interest in the lab itself, could you describe how your research is seeking to approach neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, among other focuses within your lab? So we started getting interested in, in autism in particular um, uh, about 13 or 14 years ago. And this was through a collaboration with Paul Patterson, who was a, a neuroscientist here at Caltech, and he sadly passed away in 2014. And really started thinking about, again, how do we use mouse models to understand basic microbial host interactions? Um, and our initial hypotheses really, again, lever, you know, dovetailing off of our, our work in Crohn's disease, our initial hypotheses um, uh, were around uh, immune mechanisms. You know, are there immune profiles changed by the microbiome that affect neurodevelopment, that affect brain development, that affect brain function, 
that affect behavior. Um, and it's, I mean, that concept is not new and it's not a leap. There's a lot of research, especially now um, in the last five, 10 years, really showing that <clears throat> the immune system and the, and the nervous system work like, very closely to, with each other. And that does affect behavioral outcomes. Her first few um, studies in this space uh, showed some, and we published on this, on some immune effects in the neurodevelopmental models. Um, but we were really struck by the effect of, of microbial molecules and the potential that the microbiome wasn't using the immune system to connect and interact with the brain, which certainly can, again, can happen, but was directly sending its own molecules, its own signals to the brain and maybe even bypassing the immune system or other, other systems of the body. Again, this was very much a hypothesis based on some early work in, in the mouse models where we showed that when we looked at the small molecule profile of animals that either uh, developed uh, uh, autism-like behaviors or were protected by, from developing autism-like behaviors based on what microbes we gave them, that the small molecule uh, profiles in their circulation look quite different from each other. And so we decided to pursue that. And we decided to ask, you know, are there, again, this, this direct gut to brain or microbe to brain communication at the level of defined molecules? And does that, what does that tell us about the biology of, um, uh, of gut brain connections or, or particular of autism or any other sort of um, behavioral, emotional behavioral outcome? And then we focus on a, you know, one particular molecule almost as a proof of concept. I certainly don't think this molecule begins or, answer, or ends the answer of any questions but it really sort of gives us an example of, uh, of some biology. And that molecule was 4-ethylphenyl sulfate or 4-EPS. And so we identified 4-EPS, as I said, in the circulation of mice that were different in their levels of behavior or altered behavior because of what microbes were in their intestines. And what 4-EPS did was higher levels of 4-EPS correlated with mice that showed uh, changes in their behavior that are consistent with autism. So increased anxiety, uh, decreased social interaction, decreased communication, uh, increased repetitive behavior. So sort of the, and the hallmarks of human autism, as best as can be modeled in mice. I mean, mice don't get autism. Mice can potentially model certain features of autism, but there's certainly, in my opinion, there's, you know, mouse models of autism are there to basically understand maybe some, some biology, but really what are the behavioral outputs of a discrete behavior, right? But in that being said, um, you, know, you know, we wondered whether or not the elevation of this molecule, again, which correlated with these, with these uh, behaviors, these altered behaviors, whether or not there was actually, you know, a, a consequence of the behavior, whether it was irrelevant, or whether it was actually driving those altered behaviors. Was this, a, you know, why the mice elevated levels of polyethylene sulfate. Is this why the mice had altered behaviors? And so um, in work that was just published last year, we showed that um, production of polyethylene sulfate by gut bacteria leads to buildup of that molecule in the brains of mice. And then that molecule itself is responsible for changing the function of brain cells called oligodendrocytes. So what oligodendrocytes do is they myelinate neurons. So what that means is they essentially put a protective coating around the long axons, the long projections of neurons to help neurons send their signals over long distances in our brains, sort of how, how the brain works or how the individual neurons sort of communicate between regions and, and talk to each other. And so this was really striking to us that, you know, the basic biology of the mouse brain you know, oligodendrocytes that myelinate neurons was impacted by a particular microbial molecule. And we're pretty confident that this is indeed the case because we can recapitulate this with like purified tissue or purified dendritic or oligodendrocytes, um, and really believe that again these these cells are sensing, of all things, a microbial molecule and change. You know these brain cells are changing their behavior. And then what was, um, it, and along the way. You know, there's a lot of research now showing that changes in myelination patterns correlate with altered behavior. They're found in mouse models of neurodevelopment. So that part makes sense. And then we finally showed in the mouse models that um, the phenyl sulfate itself was sufficient to drive anxiety-like behavior. And a little bit of social deficit, a little bit of vocalization, 
deficit as well, but really its major impact was to make the mouse more anxious, right? And so, you know, again, I think this is, you know, good evidence and, and the first of its kind to show a micromolecule can alter an emotional behavior in a mouse. And, um, you know, as I've already said, you know, at the end of the day, these are mouse models, but, you know, and our discovery was made in mouse models. And so how do we translate this to people? Well, you know, oftentimes discoveries in mice do not translate to people. Um, but in our case, we were lucky because at first we showed, or not lucky, but we just happened to stumble upon the right, the right molecule, the one that, you know, showed similar biology in people, because we showed that in a cohort of individuals with autism, that there's a subset, about a third of people in a large study, um, again, I can get into the details of that study, but a large study uh, that was performed at UC Davis, which had high levels of fourth phenyl sulfate if they had an autism diagnosis. And, you know, the samples that came from individuals without a diagnosis, the typically developing control group, they did not show high levels of this molecule. So at least that's a nice correlation, right, in people. Um, which again is gratifying when you're starting with mouse research because there's no guarantee that it would any of it translate to people. And then what do we do about this? So again, maybe bring full circle some of the things we've already talked about in our conversation today is through a, a biotech company that I founded in uh, 2016 called Axial Therapeutics. We leverage this basic discovery, right? Everything I've told you about is just, you know, exploring in mouse models, right? You know, we tested the hypothesis that maybe elevated levels of fourth phenyl sulfate and similar molecules, we can't exclude other molecules of this chemical uh, class, but maybe high levels of fourth phenyl sulfate were driving altered behaviors in people. Again, it's happening in the mice. We're quite confident about that, but is something similar happening in people? And so uh, basic biology plus the multiple points of intervention that we've talked about led uh, the team at Axial to devise a strategy where they said, all right, if the, here's a microbial molecule being produced in the gut, right, then it's absorbed into the circulation and then winds up in the brain, in mice, and we think similar things are happening in people, then can we intervene at the level of the gut? Meaning, what if we develop a drug that soaks up fourth phenyl sulfate in the gut, right? The drug itself isn't trying to, you know, get across the blood-brain barrier in people, right, to improve a neurological outcome, but is, you know, potentially getting to the source of why there's altered, you know, brain function. And that's because of events that begin in the gut with production of this molecule by a bacteria. So why don't we just drug the bacteria or drug the bacterial process, remove the, micro the microbial molecule from the gut, effectively lower circulatory levels of this molecule in people and see if it improves their behaviors, right? And so uh, Axel developed a, a, a gut retentive, meaning a non-absorbable drug that uh, binds fourth phenyl sulfate and molecules similar to fourth phenyl sulfate. And as it's passing through the digestive system, it binds, it soaks up, it sequesters these molecules and the molecule is just excreted in the feces, right? So this drug was taken first into mice, but then into 26 individuals with autism uh, in uh, a study in, in Australia and New Zealand. And first and foremost showed great safety and tolerability. There were no adverse events, nothing serious. Um, to you know, tolerability and compliance were excellent, which is obviously very important in, in developing any drug. Um, and then, but the study showed, you know, two major outcomes. Number one was, um, you know, what's referred to as target engagement is that the levels, the circulatory levels of fourth phenyl sulfate and related molecules came down in the people who took the medication, right? So even though it's an oral drug, the drug doesn't get into the circulation, the levels of its target, which is the small molecules made by bacteria, those decrease. So it, it worked the way we thought it was going to work, right? Which is a huge accomplishment. And secondly, but this part is, is you know, it's still under development. In that small study, uh, individuals with increased anxiety and individuals with increased irritability or aggression, many of their symptoms were reduced, meaning that their anxiety levels came down using validated assessment tools, validated questionnaires, 
um, as well as their irritability and, and, and aggression or aggressive behaviors, which again are, are happening in subsets of individuals with autism. Um, and what's interesting is that after the drug was taken away, both the levels of the molecules went back up and those behaviors, those altered behaviors, um, uh, increased again. And so all this sort of paints a picture that indeed what's happening in people may be similar to, to what, what we discovered in mice, that these molecules may be driving these altered behaviors in individuals because their levels correlate with the symptoms. The drug did what it was supposed to do. And then when the drug was removed, because remember, we're not killing the bacteria. The bacteria were there the entire time making the molecule, once the molecule, molecular levels went back up, the symptoms seem to, seem to reoccur. And so, um, again, we're quite excited about this. And it's really, I think, fascinating to think that maybe this is a mechanism to treat autism or even anxiety or other, uh, uh, you know, altered behaviors or, or effects and, and, you know, more broadly in, in even day-to-day -day mental health by just looking at the chemistry of microbes and trying to understand are there ways of balancing you know the production of certain molecules uh, that emanate from the gut because again at the end of the day it's just much easier to get a drug into the intestines we do it all the time much easier to do that than to get drugs across the blood brain barrier into the brain so again i think there's lots of reasons um, to be excited and bullish about this this approach exactly and, and i appreciate the overview and explanation of, of how your own lab itself is uh continuing to translate with great companies like axial um before i pass things along to chris i, I think I, I want to tie your all, all your work together uh within the Masmanian lab um in, in the focus here and maybe just cover a bit around your targets around uh, CNS, um, your focus mainly within amyloidosis and the potential connection between certain microbiota, um, suggesting gut microbiome may play a critical role and functional role in the pathogenesis of certain neurodegenerative diseases. I mean, including Alzheimer's, Huntington's, Parkinson's. Um, before I pass off to Chris, I, I just wanted to give you a moment to discuss the, your fascinating research here um, and, and just talk about an overview of the, uh, the focus that you all have here. Sure. Um, so maybe just briefly uh, is, uh, so we've worked on mouse models of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's in the laboratory and specifically with Parkinson's, and I alluded to this uh, some, some time ago, but um, again, most individuals with Parkinson's have gastrointestinal symptoms that manifest usually in the form of constipation. Some studies show that 80% of people with Parkinson's have, have constipation. You know, I think most studies show it's somewhere between 50 and 80%. Um, Again, this has been well documented even 200 years ago, right? I mean, people knew this uh, of this connection. Um, but it just hasn't been studied. In fact, there's even hypotheses that some form of Parkinson's may actually begin in the gut. Um, it may originate in the intestines and sort of work their way up, if you will, into the brain, which then causes the motor symptoms. Um, it's a it's an appealing hypothesis. Uh, it's called Brake's hypothesis. Um, and so what we showed uh, is that there are um, a number of different molecules produce a bacteria which can either promote symptoms in animal models or prevent symptoms in animal models. Maybe I'll just talk about the, the one that, that enhances disease outcomes is the hallmark of Parkinson's, at least the pathologist widely believed to result in the symptoms of Parkinson's is aggregation of a neuronal protein called alpha-synuclein. Right? And so, Drew, as you, as you mentioned, uh, these are uh, you said amyloid, amyloidosis. So these are amyloid proteins, meaning they're like self-aggregating proteins. And if you know these proteins unfold and start aggregating, and the proteasome or autophagy or other clearance mechanisms don't remove these protein aggregates from the cells, and they build up, they build up, and you know you get sand in the gears of a watch or a car, and you just imagine what happens. It's the same thing with the cell, right? So the cells are building up these huge, you know, balls, these huge aggregates of, of of protein that leads to cellular dysfunction. And in certain types of cells, the most vulnerable types of neurons, like dopaminergic neurons, actually leads to their death. Again, this is the prevailing hypothesis in Parkinson's. So what we showed was that this process of alpha snooking aggregation can A, in mouse models, begin in the gut, and B, can be initiated by a bacterial protein. 
And so just like uh, alpha-synuclein or A-beta or Huntington, which are neuronal proteins, which have these amyloid-like properties, bacteria make proteins which have amyloid properties. And so we wondered whether or not the bacterial amyloid somehow triggers alpha-synuclein to start aggregating, specifically in the gut. And indeed, we found a bacterial protein called CSGA. It's a component of a bacterial structure called curli. If we had more time, I'd go into that. It's not relevant for, for the Parkinson's story, but bacterial amyloids are abundant in the gut. And so by colonizing mice with um, bacteria that produce amyloids or giving the amyloid directly or a set of different experiments, we showed that indeed giving this bacterial amyloid protein nucleates or starts a cascade of events where alpha-synuclein begins to aggregate in the gut. And again, this is like a self-propagating mechanism. Once you get a little bit of alpha-synuclein aggregation, you get more and more alpha-synuclein aggregation, and it spreads throughout the neurons of the intestine, spreads in the enteric nervous system. We believe, we don't know, but it's, it, we believe it, it moves from the enteric nervous, nervous system through the vagus nerve, which is a nerve that connects the enteric nervous system to the central nervous system, and that's how the pathology migrates from the gut to the brain, and then once it's in the brain, then the alpha-synuclein aggregates then spread throughout the brain and over time cause the motor symptoms. And so again, you know, basic biology leading to a hypothesis of how bacteria, specifically the microbiome, can trigger a disease process, which has been, again, well studied in humans. And, uh, and what we did here, again, similar to what I told you about, about autism and, and microbial molecule there, is we, we asked, all right, if this is indeed the cascade of events, right, if indeed this basic biology is giving us a glimpse into what's happening in people, and if, if there is the potential that, at least again in mouse models, the Parkinson's can originate in the gut and spread to the brain, well, what happens if we stop this process in the gut, only in the gut, right? And so again, we found a, a molecule that we didn't make this molecule, it's actually a, a natural product that comes from green tea, which was known to have anti-amyloid properties, but also was known to be largely not bioavailable, meaning it's not absorbed into, into the body. It, it essentially passes through the intestines. It's a molecule called EGCG. You can actually buy it at, at Amazon, though I'm not promoting anything here. And so you can give EGCG to mice where the bacterial amyloid is initiating the Parkinson's disease, and indeed by inhibiting the bacterial amyloid from starting synuclein, alpha-synuclein aggregation, you can prevent symptoms, prevent the pathology of Parkinson's in the animal models. We have not put this into the clinic yet, but you can imagine now this concept is sort of almost this reoccurring theme in some cases and potentially in some human diseases where there is, you know, I'm not sure this is the cause of any, any human disease, but maybe a facilitator or an aggravator of disease. But if you're able to you know, prevent that negative interaction at the level of the gut, you see benefits in the brain, you see benefits potentially in, in outcomes such as behavior or, or motor symptoms. And again, for all the reasons that we've talked about in terms of safety, you know, you know, accessibility, not trying to get drugs across the blood-brain barrier, I think there's a lot of, you know, a, a lot of reason to, to be attracted to, to gut-specific or gut-targeted therapeutics. Uh, I think that's a great transition, talking about safety, talking about delivery, talking about accessibility, to shift the conversation slightly and uh, highlight sort of the future of medicine. Where does this research translate and have impact, especially in uh, patients for human health? And so as we think about that sort of innovative research and consider potential applications for both global and human health, we'd love to get your thoughts, especially given you've mentioned you're bullish on the space. We wanted to give you a platform uh, as someone who's translated his own research and been a champion for the space for so long to ask, where do you think the uh, next applications are coming from? And as we bring these new approaches forward, what do you believe will make, make the biggest impact in medicine? You know, I, I think, okay, knowing that the microbiome affects so many different organ systems in the body and potentially, you know, at least in atom models, we've shown that it's you know, either a cause or a contributor to so many different symptoms. And there's a lot of association studies in humans that the microbiome is, is dysregulated in a variety of different diseases. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to really think about how do we 
in, you know, just promote health very early in life to, you know, not just improve the day-to-day quality of life, but to also prevent potential diseases from, from occurring. And again, you know, I, I feel like we're still a long way from the actual, like, understand, like, as a society, not as microbiome researchers, from thinking about preventative medicine. But really, in my mind, that's, that may ultimately be where the microbiome has its greatest effect, right? Is just thinking about how do you set up a healthy ecosystem from birth through, you know, adolescence through development to position your body to be more robust, more resilient to fight off disease as it ages. Again, and, but disease can come in many forms. Um, again, you know, I feel like, you know, we're so focused on actually reversing disease that we're not spending enough time as, as biomedical researchers to think about how do you just, you know, prevent disease from, from occurring in the first place. Um, so this may be a lofty goal and one that, you know, may be difficult to implement, right? So how do you change lifestyles, right, over, over decades? And, and, you know, those are, those, those are not even medical problems, those are more social problems. In terms of, of therapeutics, um, I think it's clear that immunologic and metabolic diseases really have um, a close tie to the microbiome, and microbiome-based therapeutics could hopefully, you know, very rapidly change our metabolism, very rapidly change our immune systems, and you know, whether it's fighting off infections, whether it's preventing allergic or autoimmune reactions, or or treating auto- allergic autoimmune reactions. Or things like obesity or type two diabetes, I feel like the connections, and maybe because there's just more research, I feel like the connections are just more, more, more widespread, but more you know widely replicated, and so I feel like those are are more, you know obvious targets. Um, okay, I'd be remiss to say gastrointestinal infections. Clearly, the, you know I think enough work is being done there where we can sort of move on and say, okay, we, maybe we've checked that box, right? You know, there's certainly more work to do, but let's think about so the next frontier. As you're asking, Chris, you know, what where can we actually make a difference in human health? You know, I would gravitate towards you know immunologic and metabolic conditions, right? Even though our lab works on you know you know the gut-brain connection and neurological outcomes, and the reason why I think that you know the my, microbiome translating to improvements in um, behavior or neurodegeneration may be a little bit further away um, are two things, is it's not just that microbiome research in this space is still in its infancy. We're still trying to understand really like how the the gut and the brain communicate and how the microbiome and the gut communicate, but there's still a lot that's not known just from, you know, autism research, from Parkinson's research, from depression research, right? About what is it about the system, whether it's the brain or the rest of the body that is deranged that leads to these outcomes. Right, so I feel like some of the like the basic, like we don't know where the lock is for us to be able to find the key that fits into that lock, right? And so what I'm hopeful and I believe will happen is as microbiome research advances, that we'll understand more about the physiology of neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative disorders, and we'll know like what are the levers we need to pull, what are the biological processes that we need to to change to then you know restore health, maybe even to you know, you know, improve symptoms, right? To reverse existing symptoms. I feel like once that match is there, then we'll have a better line of sight of how do you devise microbiome-based therapies to impact the biology that matters for those for those conditions. In the meantime, you know, microbiome work will continue. I don't think, I'm hopeful, but I don't think microbiome research will inform neuroscience. I really believe neuroscience has to advance. So the microbiome research can know where it plugs in to, to neurobiology itself. Um, and again, you know, there's there's so much interest and excitement in this space. It's it's almost like every you know, month or every six months, I realize more and more laboratories, more and more groups are working on the gut-brain connection. And I'm just hopeful that with that amplification of research that we'll just be able to just make even more rapid progress than we've made in the last few years. But maybe I'll, I'll leave on this note is, you know, uh, I think about, and I think many people in the research community think about like the more traditional ways of improving health. And we think about drugs and, and that the road, the path to the drug development. Um, but I think there are things that people can do on a daily basis um, to start, you know, tapping into this biology themselves, right? 
And, you know, it comes from, you know, you know, approaches that make sense, making sure that you have a, a, a plant-based, you know, low sugar, low fat diet, right? We know that that not just improves human health, but we know that that's better for your microbiome. So maybe those two things are linked. Microbiome health is linked to human health, right? And think about managing stress, making sure we're active, making sure that we're getting enough sleep. You know, again, things that we're all aware of. We don't have, maybe we don't have to wait for, for drugs to be developed, but we can take, you know, our own, you know, health, our own sort of long-term health outcomes into our own hands by just living healthier lifestyles. Again, more, most proximal to the microbiome is really thinking about, um, you know, a, a very, uh, uh, you know, sort of a plant-based uh, diet approach to um, to improving our, our day to day lifestyle. I actually, absolutely love that forward looking perspective and the focus on preventative uh, wellness as well. Hopefully, we can shift that. And I that said, I won't lie; I'm still getting ice cream after this. But as we think about and uh, consider, sort of this transition of microbial uh, therapeutic applications. Would love to learn a little bit more about uh, one of the companies you founded. And thus far, uh, you founded two, um, Symbiotics Biotherapies and Axial Therapeutics. Axial, diving into the space in the CNS, is pioneering a new class of microbial targeted CNS therapeutics that develop a, and in turn developing a unique drug development platform to advance these therapies that have the potential to improve and transform the treatment paradigm and neurological diseases. Now, fully understand and recognize that there's a way to go in the space, but by the same token, would love to hear in your own words uh, how Axial is starting to lead the charge and address the challenges ahead. Yeah, Axial has, has defined its niche in the microbiome space by developing small molecules that interact directly with the microbiome. And I've given you a few examples of this. And this is a departure from what most microbiome companies are doing. Again, we've talked about this and I think it's obvious, you know, developing either fecal transplants or single organisms or, or other, you know, phage or other microbiome-based therapeutics. Um, Axel's approach is essentially to drug the microbiome itself. Right. And, you know, I think there's certain advantages to this and not just in terms of, of distinguishing it, it, you know, the company, but really thinking about um, something we talked about as well is like, how do you like protect your technology? Well, if you have a, a novel chemical entity, a molecule you own, as opposed to a natural product, it's much easier to wrap IP around that. And maybe there's even some manufacturing advantages. But, but one of the other advantages I think of is that even so, you know, there's a lot of excitement around the microbiome and a lot of drug discovery and development in the microbiome space. You know, big pharma still is at a point where they're, you know, in my opinion, taking more of a wait and see attitude um, about the microbiome, um, you know, for a number of reasons. And, and, and I won't project what I think those reasons are. But, you know, suffice it to say is that, you know, I don't think big pharma at this point is ready to make huge investments in terms of their their um, drug uh, discovery uh, activities to develop drugs from the microbiome. I think they're gonna let biotech do that. But at, at the end of the day, you know, it, I think it's obvious, pharma is just much more comfortable thinking about small molecules or biologics as the drug, as opposed to a living organism or a set of living organisms, right? And so it, I, I think one of the other advantages to Axial's approach is that it's closer to the language that pharma speaks, right? When you're developing drugs that are defined chemical entities, as opposed to, a, like I said, a, a single organism probiotic or a fecal transplant. And so, you know, I think that's, you know, ultimately may lead to a faster uh, development timeline, may lead to more buy-in from pharma and, you know, hopefully with all, with the same uh, uh, intended goal of improving human health. So maybe this is actually a faster path to getting buy-in from pharma, which at the end of the day, you kind of need, right? You know, in, in many cases um, to really have a huge impact on society, right? Is to have like big drug makers really buy into the process. Again, I think the molecular approach may be more in their wheelhouse um, than some of the, the approaches that are being developed that are more microbiome based.
I think those are very fair considerations all and goods notes to potentially wrap up on here as we start to think about what's coming next. But before we do come to that close, wanted to ask any closing thoughts, shameless plugs, something we missed or something that you'd love to share? Nothing other than, again, you know, while our, our, our scientists are working in the background to um, march down the drug development path is, you know, people to think about their own health on a day to day basis and all the things they can do. Um, to address that in a more in a more natural way, um, and um, no shameless plugs. I think I've hopefully been shameless <laughs> throughout. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, again, just you know, hopefully this and other um, uh, uh, pieces of information will get more and more people excited about both working in the microbiome, but also thinking about how to uh, leverage the microbiome to help people. And I know it's something I'm excited to dive more into moving forward. But for now, uh, how can our audience learn more about your work? Um, we, you know, we have a website, sarcus.caltech.edu. Um, there's you know, a lot of information you can find uh, on the web. And um, also just, you know, more broadly about the field, right? So we're just one lab. You know, we, we are one part of a, of a larger effort to uh, both understand and leverage the microbiome. And so many, many different uh, labs around the world that would be great resources for your audience to understand and learn more about the microbiome. All right. Well, thank you, Sarkis, for an absolutely incredible episode. I'm sure we're all excited to dig in and that our listeners had as much fun as we did. We're very grateful for your time. Thank you again. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Drew.